welcome to the course Disaster Recovery and Build Back Better. My name is Ram Satish. I'm Assistant Professor, Department of Architecture and Planning, IIT Roorkee. Today, I am going to discuss on a topic of heritage at risk, especially with the case of Ayutthaya, which is the ancient capital of uh, in Kingdom of Thailand. So, I'll go through a brief of various reports and very different kinds of analysis, the flood risk analysis and what kind of measures they have taken. So this is a very brief overview of how the heritage context comes under a risk. Before coming into the heritage context, let us also brief you about a kind of historical understanding of uh, Thailand. Much of the literature of Thailand goes back to 13th century, which we found uh, more evident. That is where the Lana Kingdom, where you can see the Lana Kingdom, and uh, the first ancient, this is they refer as the first ancient kingdom, which is the Suktai, right? So, the Lana Kingdom is in the northern part of the Thailand, and Chiang Mai actually comes from here, and the Bangkok. The today's Bangkok comes from here and Ayutthaya some, somewhere here. So now from the 13th century, if we go back to the 14th century, this is where the Ayutthaya, Lana and you can see this Ayodhya. Ayodhya, when you heard this name Ayutthaya or Ayodhya, it actually reflects uh, the mythological stories of Ramayana, the epics of Ramayana from Indian subcontinent. There are many similarities between uh, the Indian culture and the Thai culture. In fact, uh, when you say even Indonesian cultures, the Thai cultures, we have some similarities which share this particular epic. Have you heard about uh, Jathayu, which is uh, a kind of bird which protect, tried to fight with Ravana when he was carrying Sita to Lanka? So, in fact, the national symbol of uh, Thailand is actually Jathayu. So, they share a similar epics of what we share. And it also reflects to the birthplace of Rama. I mean, there has been various studies, like there is a document on locating Lanka, where they discussed about different understandings of the how Ayodhya has been positioned both in Thailand and as well as in the Indian continent. And uh, there might have been a lot of geomorphological issues from that generation to this, this time to this time. So maybe uh, we never know how was the situation at that time, but the story has been reflected and has been continued for generations and generations, even today. And uh, Ayodhya also reflects back to Rama. And uh, this is a friend of mine, Burin uh, Taravik. Chetukun from uh, uh, Thailand, uh, he actually worked on the Thai identity and I could able to see that, uh, you know, gather some information from his work, basically on the historical aspects of it. So now, uh, the Suktai have gradually becomes the Ayodhya, you know, uh, this is the Ayodhya kingdom and um, which is about a century after, 13th and 14th century. And now, the Chiang Mai plus Siam, which is the Siamese uh, on the 20th century. So now this whole thing has been now into the Siam. And uh, now the Lana part has been very limited. And that is where the Chiang Mai, which is still reflecting its traditional identity and the cultural resources. So this is how the overall understanding of how the historical layers have been uh, uh, framing Thailand. And uh, the Bangkok becomes the capital city of the Thailand and Chiang Mai becomes a kind of cultural capital. So, uh, Burin also works out the kind of timeline, especially in 12th century uh, or 13th century where the Suktai has uh, frames the Lana Kingdom and about Ayutthaya, which is the 1350 to almost 17th century where the Burmese have devastated the Ayutthaya Kingdom. 
in the war and that is where the Siam which is the Siam kingdom has been started from 17th century and you can see that King Rama V so many of their king names is actually named of King Rama I, Rama II, Rama III and that is how the Burmese invasion also has an impact on so this is the time we are talking about Ayutthaya and as I has, which has been the capital as well. In terms of the houses, in terms of the architecture, it also varies from different uh, historical influences and different belief systems have also made some significant differences in the architecture. For instance, uh, many of the traditional houses, they were designed for this hot and hum humid climate and uh, you know, therefore the ventilation is very much essential for these kind of climates. And that is the climate and the geography is one aspect and also there is a, a religious aspect with the seniority plus Buddhism which frames the form of the building and a steep roof and a long use for heat protection and fast drainage for heavy rain because it has been a very um, you know, uh, flood prone areas. And there is a supporting rails, a buffer area provide air, air circulation to cool living spaces and avoid seasonal flooding because that is one aspect uh, all the houses are raised on a stilt. So this is how a traditional uh, houses in the central parts of Thailand which you see like you have uh, the whole house is raised in stilts and that is how uh, the whole program and in Chiang Mai and Bangkok these are the two important uh, places one has to look at it because this is more of a kind of metropolis a capital city and this is more of a cultural capital and the Lana house and the Siamese house how they differ you know in terms of their orientation and in terms of their organized like you have the Chan they call it the terrace the ten veranda and the kitchen has been little isolated from it and that is how this is the kitchen and this is the chan where they do even some kind of agricultural activities like taking out the seeds and other things and this is how the common terrace so this is a very slight difference in the in terms of the layout and the lana house is very much linked to the animist approach you know the animist beliefs systems that is where uh, they try to portray that in the shape of a buffalo because they believe in uh, animism which is providing the protection and happiness to the family whereas uh, the Siamese house and the Thai house it reflects to the spiritual aspects of the highest goal you know of the Buddhism which is talking about the Nirvana and then we come to the Ayutthaya which is uh, has been an ancient kingdom as I said to you it also reflects some stories about the Rama the birthplace of Rama in Ayodhya but uh, in Thai it has been founded in 1351 by King Yu Thong who went there to escape a smallpox outbreak in Loburi and proclaimed it the capital of his kingdom and this is often referred as Ayutthaya kingdom or Siam so that is where the Ayutthaya has became the second Siamese capital of the Suktai with the, the Suktai which I showed you earlier so this has become more of the second capital and this city is located at the junction of Chao Praya and Lopuri and Pasak rivers so it is almost a kind of uh, delta kind of thing so this particular historic city has some religious meanings and the historical understanding to it and there is a cultural significance and cultural integrity and there is a cultural context which actually frames this uh, historical city and this has been 17th century it has been destroyed by the Burmese uh, military and then later on it has been converted as a uh, Ayutthaya historical park when it has been recognized as UNESCO World Heritage Site and this is where it has reflected with its outstanding universal value where we talk about OUV. I am going to refer about mainly two to three important documents and uh, this particular paper which talks about the disaster aspect of it where the flood risk assessment in the areas of cultural heritage 
and how it has been applied in the Ayutthaya. So this is a group of authors which work that has been published in Natural Hazards. And Vujunuik and Michael Hamon, Daria Golub, Suyane Horensley and others, you know, they have actually published this a very recent document. So first they talk about um, the, what is a flood risk assessment, you know, because that is FRA, we call it as flood risk assessment. That is a very basic key tool as a traditional approach in the traditional approach to understand and managing the flood risk. So, um, and, uh, if you look at the FRA techniques, much of the work has been mostly focused on the quantitative aspects or the target based tackles, how much has been impacted or the cause of dam and the cost of damage to the property and the business disruption and you know, either it may be quantified in financial terms. And when it talks about these quantifiable impacts, do not reflect the entire effects of flooding, you know, that like for instance, there are not only about the monetary aspects, there's a physical aspect and there is also to do with the non-monetary aspects of it, the intangible aspects of it. So this is where the loss and life, loss of cultural heritage, which has been often neglected in the FRA tools. So when we say about the hazard assessment of any floods, that is where the hydrologists, they talk about many hydrological models, when it's a 1D model, the 2D models, and which actually talks about the, represent the process by which rainfall is converted into the surface runoffs, you know. So how much water, volume of water and how much uh, surface runoff is carried out. So this is all about uh, the quantitative aspect of it and the modeling and the simulation aspect of it. Whereas in the vulnerability assessment, it actually has to, it is often assessed using the site specific indicators or measurements. And this is where the multiple aspects which has to be combined by multi criteria methods. There is also the qualitative aspects, there is also the financial aspect, there is a the livestock, there is uh, livelihood, there is human loss, there is a property damage, there is infrastructural damage. So, it's a different sets of uh, uh, impact situations which we consider varies from site to site. But in this kind of conditions, we need to look at the culture as an important cultural vulnerability. So, there is two approaches when the author they try to relate with the traditional approach where we call about R is equal to risk is equal to hazard when vulnerability adds on to it that is where the risk component comes to it. And this is the risk perception approach, how people, how the communities perceive this approach, you know, the uh, risk. Like that is where they try to compare, like in the factors underlying the level of risk, here the hydro meteorological conditions and the catchment, the land wage areas. And what are the land use of exposed demographics, social and political institutions and the governance. Whereas here, when we talk about the perception aspects of it, the level of knowledge, the beliefs and values, the media and the trust in the experts, cultural institutions and the past experience, what they have understood, what they have experienced. Disaster characteristics, this is where the flood magnitude, flood frequency and uncertainties. Whereas the direct and indirect damages, the tangible and as well as intangible damages. So this is where again the perception brings about the familiarity, controllability, voluntariness of exposure, catastrophic potential and the assessment techniques, maximum they might narrow down to hydrological and hydraulic modeling and depth damage curves except inundation maps and all this. Whereas here they talk about the heuristics, cognition and intuitions. And what is the output out of it? It takes as a hazard map and the vulnerability map and that is how a flood risk map is generation. But there is also the risk perception, risk as acceptance, Ex risk to whom, when, how do they prepare for it, how do they accept it, risk behavior. So this is again, this whole thing comes from the social and uh, community. It is very community specific, it is also uh, society specific, how they look at it, how they see it, how they behave to it. So now when you look at the Ayotha Island which is located in the urban area, so almost one third of this island 
uh, is under the World Heritage Site. So, and you can see that the river processes the kind of, kind of the whole island is set up in the, the river basins, the two lands coming. And what this authors have di tried to do is they try to do club both the methods of both one is the you know the scientific approach of it and the, the second is the social, social approach to it and the perception of it and they see how they are actually relating to it. Like it is about a 1D model, this is a 1D model of 52 kilometer stretch of Chayo Praya river and which has uh, a number of tributaries that include Lopuri, Pasak rivers which actually meet at Ayodhya. But they also collected a lot of rainfall data and four rain gauges and then this 1D model is coupled with a 2D model of the urban area to investigate the propagation of excess flood offer that is where how much inundation is created and uh, from the 1D river system of Pasak, Lopuri and Chao Praya rivers into the using and they use the software of DHI Mike flood software. So here what you can see is that the intensities this is you know about uh, they developed this contour topography of Ayutthaya land derived from 2 meter grid scale resolution from the satellite data and how it can actually create uh, the inundance areas. Then the physical vulnerability, so there is a for assessing the physical vulnerability four different classes of the built environment are identified, residential buildings, cultural properties and the critical infrastructure and the roads, the connectivity. And within each group, they also categorize the vulnerability part of it, low, medium and high. So if you look at it, the, the pillared house in the residential buildings, they are uh, subject to the medium, but whereas in the high, which is a one story house, which is based on the land, they are subjected mostly to the high risk. Similarly, in the cultural properties, which has been submerged, they are not restored. And whereas the archaeological remains, you know, and whereas some of these properties which are restored back. Critical infrastructure includes hospitals, police stations and ATMs, water supply and they are all subjected to the high risk. And the roads which is the asphalt roads which are in the low risk and gravel roads and unpaved roads which are more into the high risk. That is how uh, the categorization of the built environment into three vulnerable classes. And then Coming to the social approach, what they did was they divided into uh, eight sectors, the whole region into the eight sectors like you can see the, the river delta which is forming out and the whole heritage property is about here. And the, what they did was they divided this whole territory, residential territory into eight sectors and the community representatives from each sector formed a group to accomplish the group mapping exercise. So there is a huge exercise what they did developed in each sector and collected a lot of inventories and the data. So the biggest difficulty here is uh, comparing the two maps because of their spatial data format. One is the traditional flood risk map uses the 1 meter raster grid cells whereas the risk perception map is based on the polygons of varying sizes. So that is very difficult to compare the same set of spatial data. When uh, this is the flood hazard uh, map of the extreme and uh, there is given the threshold values of 0.5 to 1.5 meter depth of inundation, this is a inundation map and if you can see that this whole region is completely flooded, right, about 1.5 meter height of inundation. And on the banks, at least, you can see that the whole thing is in the inundation. So that is how what they did was they tried to classify different layers of it and like physical vulnerability. Now, when you talk about the physical vulnerability, what are the places which has been in a highly damaged, medium damaged and the low damaged and uh, which has been not defined. Similarly, the social, the target groups which are actually which are the most of these communities which are often affected and uh, this is the social vulnerability map and the economic vulnerability. When we say economic vulnerability, when the flood happens obviously what kind of business sector often closes down, shuts down for a period of some time and 
uh, or um, uh, how their livestock gets damaged. So this is all about the economical. Mostly you can see that on the edges, you can see that most of the commercial aspects has been damaged. The cultural uh, vulnerability, and you can see that you know uh, much of the cultural properties are under the high risk. And uh, this is where one has to understand that uh, the heritage, which is uh, UNESCO World Heritage, is subject to the high risk. And tomorrow, if these things get collapsed and they get damaged, then we are actually closing the history. We are actually bringing uh, an intense damage to the history, where the next generations has to learn about their own country, their own ancestors. Now, what they did was uh, they tried to combine this map and um, one is using all the digital tools how they combined and this is again a combined flood risk map by a traditional approach. So by both by the so social approaches and as perception approach and by their uh, scientific approaches, how they have able to get a similar set of data. But of course, they could able to identify there are some possibilities which were more possible in the scientific approach, but in certain perception approach, they have lacking some kind of data. So that is uh, the authors. Uh, they have articulated very well in that report that what aspects they could able to get from this and what aspects they could not able to get in this. I think one can go through that report. But here what we have to see is what we have to learn from is that how even the satellite imagery and the social understanding how they are able to correlate with each other and also they in parts they also contrast with each other. I mean, till now I talked about the flood analysis part of it and how different techniques have been used by various authors. But then from the conservation point of it, how the ICOMOS um, or how, what kind of report they have produced on the historic city of Ayutthaya. So one is there is a direct impact of the major flooding in 2011 which and there has been lack of some emergency measures for conservation as well because there is a also some rush process indicated. And this flood water will have both the mid-term and the long-term impacts you know, on the heritage sites. So what kind of conclusions they have come up with? Now when we say about the conclusions, the future measures against major floods. One is the protection from flooding, how we can protect this site. But if you look at this existing site, if the river is just these temples have uh, this Watchai place is just near to the, so it all the whole thing gets flooded. So the authorities are actually preparing to set up an emergency flood prevention barrier and uh, they want to make an artificial barrier using the concrete uh, and the metal barrier so that at least it can obstruct the flood water penetrating into the historic sites. So this is one aspect. The other aspect is the measures to mitigate the impact of flood water. So when we say about uh, what kind of measures we can adopt, so one easiest method, inexpensive method is planting the trees. So imagine if people start planting the trees and especially bamboo is one aspect one because it can densely grow and as well as it was very quick in growing. So there are some species one can identify and plantation could be possible in these kind of uh, flood affected areas. So because being a historic context one has to look at the learning from history. So reproduction of a city wall. So historians think that how this geography was existing even before this has become a heritage site even in the 13th century. How the ancient, I mean those days how people have survived. Obviously, they might have built a wall before in order to protect this particular kingdom. So why not we can think of reproducing of the city wall. So there might be possibility that when the kingdom has moved, so they might have taken all these bricks and taken out and probably this area might have got abandoned. So these are some various theories which has also thought about. So how in what ways we can reproduce a city wall. And when we talk about the looking back about how 
man has lived and have survived these floods. This is where the traditional measures we can even identify him from the rediscovering the traditional wisdom, the traditional knowledge systems which of that day's man have implemented. So there is a need that we can relook into it, rediscover into it, these kind of practices and then try to implement in our contemporary practice situations. So at least some learnings could help us to show some direction. And the third aspect is the comprehensive plan for conservation and utilization. So how you know the arts department have developed a comprehensive plan for both the conservation and the living heritage. Then they also talked about the international symposium of Ayodhya symposium, where we can learn from the global experts of flood resilience. You know how we can uh, learn from each other. So that is a kind of international symposium. So some of the photographs I'll go through it, and then uh, so there's a new square basis which has been constructed using some concrete tie beams, and what they try to do is they made a, a basis with the tie beams, the rails of plinth, and then they covered with the brick part of it. So in many places, uh, that is one thing, the authentic question, you know, why uh, is there any particular scientific study which says that why we have to go with the tie beam, why not a traditional, so how they come to that kind of conclusion. And the question of authenticity also comes into the picture. And is it a right way of a conservation practice? So there are many questions in this particular practice which comes. And these are all again the new constructed plinths and whether is it the only method we have going back with the structural understanding or how the traditional understanding has been overlooked. These are some aspects we can look at. And conservation philosophy and execution should ideally converse because on one side we are talking about the authentic heritage and the other side we have to talk about how to protect it. So they has to really come together. Now these uh, undulating brick layers not the best of the workmanship. For instance, if you ever look at this kind of circular mounds, uh, even in uh, Andhra, you can see in Gantasala, where this similar kind of structures, uh, stupas have been, brick stupas have been constructed, where the brick sizes were very different, the brick component is very different, and even the bonding, you can see that, you know, how the bonding could be also uh, worked out, so that the load could be transferred easily. And you can see that a lot of improvement could be done because whatever they have done, uh, it's still uh, one can see that you know the bonding has not been appropriately taken care of, even the material component on the brick sizes. And also the material, the composition of motor, the lime and the old and new lime motor, so one can see that the basic fundamental difference of it. Of course, in conservation, we also have to make sure that the what has been added later, it has to reflect because uh, it all varies about the context where we are applying and what context, what we want to show and what we need to show. That is how the whole conservation and management plan has to talk about. And replastering in patches, you know, the, like you can see that this many of the things have been replastered and uh, different patchwork has been done. But is it the only way to do it? Because this is the, one of the common practice you find in many of the conservation projects where they try to put this either on a lime plaster or, but the, the nearest composition, we should take back at least the nearest composition that will make some difference. And the new tiles where they have raised for the tourism purpose, you know, that have actually raised and challenge to the authenticity of the monument. So they need to be removed and replaced with the brick paving. So in that way, that authenticity has to be maintained. And here what you can see is that conservation philosophy of restoring and the reconstruction, but where to stop it, how to stop it. That is one aspect one has to really think about it. As we see the straight joints, you know, so how this reflects the poor workmanship. The problem is the workmanship in the conservation projects is very moderate. At cases it is poor in such a situation. 
So I hope uh, you got an idea of uh, one of the heritage site of Ayodhya, how the analysis has been carried out and with that what kind of implications has been framed out and still what are the challenges we have in conservation and the development. Uh, this will give you an idea. Thank you very much.